Hello, friend. You know, in 2 Peter, Peter says something that is astonishing. He talks about if you will engage in certain things and incorporate certain things into your life, you will never stumble. Now, I didn't say that. Peter, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said it. If you'll do these things, if you'll engage in these things, you will never stumble. So grab your Bible. We're going to get into the Word of God together. I'd like to begin reading in verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll read through verse 11. It says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ he made a statement in verse 8 if these things the faith and virtue and knowledge and perseverance and self-control etc if these things are yours and abound you will neither be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ the word barren means to be idle or inactive you won't be idle or inactive or unfruitful if these things are yours and they abound. You know, some that say they know the Lord and walk with the Lord, if you look at their life, things just don't tend to add up because there's not fruit and they're not progressing. They're inactive as far as their walk with God goes. And you know, the Lord does look for fruit in our lives. Jesus teaches us to look for fruit, and the world is looking for fruit when it comes to the church as well. Did you know that most people, even the biggest critics of the church and those that make fun, they're just hoping that you're not another house of cards. They're just hoping, you know, you're not another paper tiger that's, you know, all roar and no substance. They're looking for fruit. They're looking for something that's real. And again, the Lord tells us to look for fruit, and He certainly is looking for fruit. What have you told someone that had never seen a peach tree? This is a peach tree. They go, wow. And so they watch it, and they watch it, and they watch it. And one season rolls into another season, to another season, another year, another year, another season, another season. And it never has any peaches. Well, they've never seen a peach tree before. You claim that's a peach tree, but it never bears peaches. They're going to wonder. And by the same token, if you go, this is a Christian. People are watching. And if there's never any fruit, never any progress, people are going to wonder and with good cause. But if these things are ours, if they're in us and they abound, we will be fruitful and we certainly will be busy. We won't be idle. We'll be making measurable progress in our walk with God. And then in verse 9, he said, but he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness spiritually blind. It says they, they can't see far off. They're short-sighted. They can't see where they're going. And then he mentions that they've forgotten they were cleansed from their old sins. So they can't see forward and they don't do too well at looking backwards either. They don't remember where they've come from. And I'm convinced it's always a good thing to remember where you've come from. I think often about how the Lord has rescued me and what he's brought me out of. And listen, I've been walking with Jesus 35 years, and to this day, it's very hard for me not to weep 
when I think back of what I was into and how he revealed himself to me and how he rescued me. Don't get too far away from your salvation experience and what he delivered you from. One thing it'll do for sure is it'll keep you from pointing some telescopic finger, you know, at somebody else that's on a journey, you know, maybe that's struggling with some things. When you remember what you used to do. Sometimes we get so critical, oh, they've been out of the clubs and they've been doing drugs and they've been doing, we used to do all the same stuff. You slept with everybody on the block and everybody from the next 10 blocks around. <laughs> remember where God's rescued you from. But if we don't have these things and they're not abounding in us, hey, we, he said, we, we will forget where we've come from. We won't be able to see where we're going. And frankly, our life will be a mess. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. In other words, we need to be actively engaged in pursuing these things. Be even more diligent to make your call and election Sure. In other words, confirm it. And the way you do it says, for if you do these things, you'll never stumble. The way we confirm and make our election and our calling sure is to tend to these things with diligence. And he makes that statement again in verse 10. If you do these things, you'll never stumble. You won't fall. You won't slip. You won't make a false step. You won't fail. You won't be lost. You won't fall away. You won't collapse on the march. You won't backslide. You won't fall away. Hallelujah. How many think that's a pretty good promise? You will never stumble if you tend to these things with diligence. Now, if we do fail and come up short, chances are it's because we've been neglecting one of these areas. And I, for one, don't want to stumble. I don't want to fall short. I don't want to collapse on my march to the finish line. I want to be richly rewarded as I get that entrance into his kingdom on that final day. So let's talk about these things. The first one he mentions in verse 5 says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So the first thing is faith. Back up in verse 1, if you would. Look what Peter says. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like precious means equal value faith. He said, hey, you guys, you've obtained equal value faith with us. Now, I think pretty, it's a pretty cool thing to have equal value faith with the apostle Peter. All right? How did we obtain this like precious, this equal value faith? He's saying that we should... Add virtue onto our faith. All right, where does faith come from in the first place? According to Romans 12, 3, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, it comes alive by hearing it. Romans 10, 17, it grows by using it. But initially, it is a deposit, if you would, a gift from God. Faith is the foundation. Without it, we cannot please God. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Not difficult, not hard, impossible. We get saved by faith. Faith brings answers to our prayers. Faith is the medium of exchange in heaven, if you would. It is the currency of heaven. And I know some people have thought, well, that's it, man. Faith is all there is. I know one preacher used to say, all you need is faith in God. But actually, some people that have said faith is all you need have failed miserably. Faith certainly is a foundation. Faith is the beginning, but it's not all there is. There's much that needs to be added to it. As he said in verse 5, so be diligent to add to your faith virtue. It's the second thing, virtue. Some translations say, supplement your faith with virtue. I remember the first time I read another translation and it said, supplement your faith. I immediately thought of food supplements. And I, I remembered back, you know, when I, I, I left home as a teenager and I was living in, in Utah for a while and in a, I had a little camper shell on the back of my truck and I had a, a, an extreme shortage of funds. And so I went to a damaged food store 
and I bought a case of macaroni and cheese that was water damaged. And uh, I didn't have any salt, I didn't have any pepper, I didn't have any milk, I didn't have any butter. I just had water and a little, like what we used to call a grasshopper stove, sort of like a Bunsen burner. And, uh, and I, I spent a winter in the back of my, my little camper shell back there, basically just had a thing where you could put a bed on it and with my little Bunsen burner stove. And for breakfast, I had macaroni and cheese. And that was all. No salt in it, no pepper, no butter, no milk, just heat up the noodles with the water and empty that little packet in there. That was breakfast. You know what I had for lunch? Macaroni and cheese. You know what I had for dinner? Macaroni and cheese. You know what I had the next day? Macaroni and cheese. You know what I had the next day? Macaroni and cheese. You know what was on the diet for next week? Macaroni and cheese. I ate that whole case. Macaroni and cheese by myself, no salt, no anything. And an amazing thing to this day, I still like macaroni and cheese. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I came to the conclusion pretty quickly, man, I need to supplement this diet with something else. You can't just eat macaroni and stay healthy and grow strong. Healthy bodies not just built on macaroni and a strong life in God is not just built on faith alone, though faith is incredibly important. Now, as I said, those were my first thoughts when I read that translation. It said, supplement your faith with virtue. But actually, as I studied further, I discovered something very interesting. And Peter himself was making an analogy here by the Greek word that he used. The Greek word for add literally comes from a word meaning to be a choir director. And to add in the Greek language literally is the function of a choir director. So when he said, add to your faith virtue and all of these other things, he's likening you unto the leader of a choir. And he's saying, hey, there's more voices necessary than just the bass voice. You need to arrange your choir and get all of the voices singing. If you don't get everyone singing, the show is liable to close down. So giving all diligence, add to your faith. Giving all diligence. It is hard work to get the whole choir singing in unison and everybody playing their part. And he gives us the names of all the different choir members. But the point is there are other there are other voices besides the voice of faith in the choir. Next, we want to listen to the voice of virtue. It means courage. Add to your faith courage. It means courage, valor, manliness, moral excellence. How many of you worked out it takes courage to serve Jesus? Man, it does. It, you're swimming upstream in a downstream world when you say yes to Jesus Christ. You'll find out that the world, the flesh, and the devil will all want to pull you the wrong direction, and it takes courage. It takes virtue to do the right thing in a wrong world. Not to crumble under the passions of the flesh or be squeezed into the world's mold. To live what you know is right takes courage. Faith alone is not enough. We must also have moral excellence. A faith appropriates God's power, and thank God it does. It gives us access into everything that the grace of God provides. The Bible says in the book of Romans that faith gives us access into the grace of God in which we stand. Grace is the hand that reaches out and freely offers everything that's available to us, you know, through Christ's sacrifice and through the mercy of God. So we definitely need faith. It gives us access to God's power. But listen, power without character is dangerous. All the stuff without moral excellence will ruin us. And that's why he says, hey, you need to get some other voices singing in the choir here. But the rest of that equation is also true. Moral excellence is not enough without faith. We need to have both. You ever think of the, the story of the prodigal son in this connection? 
You know, one brother, the younger brother, I like him a lot. I mean, I know he messed up, but I like him. He had faith. He asked the Father for big things. I want my inheritance. I want it now. And he, he received his entire inheritance from the Father. He wasn't afraid to ask and to ask big. He had confidence that he could get that which he asked for. The younger son had faith. But you know what? He lacked moral excellence, didn't he? He lacked virtue. And he went out and, man, he messed up big time. But you know, the older brother never accessed any of the things that were his. In fact, he got mad. And his father says, oh, you never threw a party for me. And the father said, look, all I have is yours. You could have had it at any time. You never asked. But he did have virtue. He said, I never transgressed your commandment. I didn't do anything wrong. You know, I, I did the right things. I towed the line. So we've got one of them has great faith, and the other one has great moral excellence, and both of them are a mess. I think we need to take the, the best from both of them. Have great faith, have great virtue as well. And as that story teaches us, a person who has faith but no virtue will eventually self-destruct. And a person of virtue without faith will become critical and self-righteous. So there's two voices in our choir so far, the voice of faith, and the voice of virtue. Let's add a third voice to that, knowledge. Again in verse 5, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue to virtue, knowledge. The Greek word here for knowledge carries with it the thought of seeking to know, taking on knowledge, continuing to seek to know more about God, His Word, about His Son, about His Spirit, some have stopped growing because they have stopped seeking to grow. They let the boss think for them at work. They let the television think for them when they're at home. And they let the preacher think for them on the weekend. I think God likes people that ask questions. I like people that ask questions. Now, you get religious people will get very mad when somebody rocks the boat and asks questions. They say, well, you're just being rebellious. God loves a good, honest question. God loves it when people think for themselves. You can't grow if you don't think. You can't grow if you don't ask questions. So don't be satisfied with letting other people think for you all the time. Think on your own. Hunger and thirst after God. Seek after Him. Those that hunger and thirst will be filled. Those that don't hunger and don't thirst, they're dead. Even naturally speaking, you stop hungering and thirsting, something is terribly, terribly wrong. So I think we need to settle the fact that as long as we're alive, we should be growing and we should be learning. The moment that we start thinking we have arrived, or we know all there is to know about anything, or even become satisfied or complacent in our quest for a deeper knowledge of God, we are in serious trouble. You know, I was coming back from overseas. I've had a few trips recently, but on one of them, I got up early in the morning, and, and I hadn't done this in a long time, because a lot of times after I've been away ministering, it's been like nonstop, and I get on the plane, and I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to sleep. And so, man, I put a blanket and I'm gone until the plane touches down in Los Angeles, wherever I'm coming from. That's pretty standard. But I woke up really early that morning and I, I just was praying and I, I found myself praying, God, I pray you'd open a door of utterance for me. I want to talk to somebody about Jesus on the plane. And uh, so I sit down and, and this, you know, gentleman uh, comes and sits next to me. And he cracks a joke immediately. I thought, I like this guy, you know. So we sit down, and he asked me what I do and what I've been doing in that particular city, in that country. And before the plane took off, I shared my whole testimony with him. <laughs> and uh, we talked for hours. And, you know, he was an agnostic, admitted agnostic. He was 79 years old. And he asked lots of questions. Listen intently. Talk to him about the Bible, talk to him about my faith in Christ, 
talked about, you know, why certain things are certain ways, talked about why I got involved in drugs, you know, what my motivations were for that, the best that I could figure them out, you know, what the pressures, you know, were, were upon me in that day when I was young and I, I, I slipped into that lifestyle and why I stayed in it for so many years. Anyway, when we landed in L.A., he shook my hand. He says, Bayless, I just want to thank you. He says, I learned some things today. And the fact is, is I learned some things as well. Now contrast that with a believer that I talked to. Had been to a couple of the small groups from church and came up to me and says, look, is there anything else going on? I can't learn anything in these small groups. I know everything they're teaching. <laughs> now at that time, I was, prepare, I was personally preparing all the lessons for the small groups at that time. <laughs> now they didn't know that. And I just thought, okay, now I've been giving them my best shot, so you're basically saying that you can't learn anything from me. And it was just like, you know, it was bizarre. I felt like punching him, but I didn't. <laughs> but the moment we stop learning, and this word knowledge, again, it, it carries with the thought of, of, you know, adding knowledge and pursuing knowledge and seeking knowledge. It's another voice in the choir. We need to be hungry to grow. Because the truth is, is if you're not going forward in Christ, you are going backwards. There's really no such thing as remaining static in this walk with Christ because there's too many elements and too many forces in the world and, and in the spirit world as well and in your own flesh that'll pull you the wrong direction. Listen, the current is going the wrong way, baby, as long as we're on planet Earth. And if you're not making forward progress and seeking to grow, then, then you will be pulled back the other way. And it's one of those things that we have to add if we're not going to stumble and if we're going to be fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, there's three ways, three avenues that we basically learn more about God. Prayer, you get on your knees, you talk to God, you listen for His voice, you will learn about God in the place of prayer. Secondly, from His Word, spend time in the book. It is a revelation of God. If you want to know what a person thinks, you need to listen to him talk. This is a revelation of God's thoughts. If you wanted to know what the author of a, uh, you know, of a, of a book thought, you, you need to read his book. Spend time in the Word. And, and included in that certainly is, is you know, listening to preaching and, and uh, you know, reading books you know, about the Bible. But I like something Billy Graham said. This was after 25 years of ministry. Someone asked him, if you could change anything about this last quarter of a century where you've walked with God, what would it be? He said, the one thing I would change, he said, I would spend more time with the Bible and less time with books about the Bible. That's worth it just for the whole evening, by the way. Um, so prayer, spending time in the Word, and then through experience, you know, discerning God's providential hand at work in the affairs of life, especially as we endeavor to be faithful witnesses and to carry out his plan in our lives. I'm convinced that even through failure, we can learn great things about God if we'll have a right heart attitude, one that's seeking to know. Just an example. You mess up and you fail. Maybe you, you, maybe you failed morally. Maybe you backslid. Maybe you crashed and burned and, you know, you just kind of submerged for six months and and, uh, you know, weren't in church, weren't away from God, and we don't want to know what you've been up to, and you probably don't want to tell. <laughs> all right, but you, you, you come back and say, God, you know what? That song tonight got me all in. I realize I need to get all in. I need to sell out. All right, you, you, you failed. Here's some things you can learn from that. Failure is not a permanent verdict if you'll look to God. God is merciful and forgiving. Nothing takes God by surprise. I need to be more compassionate towards the struggling. My past does not have to be the prophet of my future. God can do a new thing. That the world, the flesh, and the devil will pull me in the wrong direction if I let them. That God's warnings and his roadblocks can be very, very subtle, and I need to be sensitive to them. That I need the counsel and the fellowship 
of other believers. Just to name a few thoughts, some things that you might pick up if you have a heart that's seeking a a after knowledge. We should be growing and learning things all the time. I hope you were encouraged by that, friend. You're not going to want to miss next week where we finish the message. You know, that last point about learning from failure. The truth is, is if you get up, you are not a failure. You are just a learner. Righteous man falls seven times, but gets up again. The Apostle Paul said, cast down, but not destroyed. One translation where he made that statement to the Corinthians, he said, we've been knocked down, but we're not knocked out. I want to encourage you to get up again in Jesus' name. God loves you. We love you. We'll see you next time. What's the most important thing in your life? Family? Work? Friendship? Maybe it's God. Think about where your time and money go. How much of our time is consumed in the pursuit of the trivial and the unimportant? And I began to think, what's important to God? Whatever's important to God should be important to us. In Bayless Conley's series, What God Considers Important, he'll show you what God's priorities are and how that can change and shape your life. Use the information on the screen or visit us online. Get Bayless Conley's life-changing series, What God Considers Important, on CD or DVD. The wise man or the wise woman will major on the majors rather than majoring on the minors in life. And even more significant than that is finding out what is important to God, because there are some things that God attaches special significance to. We need to find out what they are and really concentrate on them. Included are six messages available on CD or DVD. Discover how to put the importance of truth, focus, God's Word, marriage, your heart, and your witness to others in line with the power of God. And when you call or visit us online, Remember that your gift makes it possible for the Answers broadcast to continue bringing our living Jesus to a dying world. Hello, friends. I would like to invite you to some meetings I'm going to be doing in Germany, October 11th through the 16th. We'll be in Berlin, Duisburg, Wuppertal, Munich, and Stuttgart. Bayless is not what we think a typical American. He is clear, there's a message with, with hope, with power, with faith. It was awesome and just perfect. I hope that you can come out to one of the meetings. I would love to meet you. And listen, I love Germany. I am so looking forward to be back with my friends and all the German people. So again, that's October 11th through the 16th. We'll be in Berlin. Duisburg, Wuppertal, Munich, and Stuttgart. So I hope to see you at the meetings in October. God bless you.